Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. First things first, next week's video will be our monthly Q&A. Please post your questions related to martial art, Xiu Dao, and Chinese culture in the comment section or on the Ask Dao Yi channel in the Dao Yi Discord, or email me if you prefer to be anonymous. Today, I will talk about the differences between traditional Kung Fu and contemporary Wushu. An interesting and important topic, which will help you all better understand internal martial art practice. But first, let's get high on tea. Today's tea is a Shou Mei, a type of a white tea. Shou means longevity, Mei means eyebrow. The legendary story goes that the shape of this tea leaf looked like the eyebrow of Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism and considered immortal in religious Taoism. Shou Mei, or longevity eyebrow, is a very elegant name in Chinese. So far, I have introduced 23 types of tea, the first of which was Bai Mu Dan, or white peony tea, a tea from the same family as Shou Mei since both are white teas. Traditionally, there are three types of white tea, silver needle, white peony, and shou mei, and each category further have many subcategories, depending on the time to pick the tea leaves. Typically, silver needle is considered the most expensive tea because only the tea bud are used to produce it due to its uh, sweet flavor, thus limiting the quantity produced. However, those who prefer a strong flavor and thick tea texture often choose Shou Mei over others. It is worth noting that there is another category of uh, white tea, which is uh, Gong Mei, a white tea very close to Shou Mei but produced with tea leaves from a different tea species. Since it is very close to Shou Mei, it is often grouped into the Shou Mei category. So, white tea produced using only the tea buds is a silver needle. White tea produced with only bud and one or two leaves is a white peony. Last but not the least, White tea produced with one bud and two or three leaves is Shou Mei. Since Shou Mei tea used bigger leaves, it has a stronger flavor. Shou Mei is the best produced in the spring and fall seasons. Tea leaves picked in the fall are especially better since tea components get stronger in the leaves by the time fall season arrives. However, some tea manufacturers use tea leaves picked in the summertime in order to make quicker sales and profits instead of waiting for the fall season. Shou Mei produced with summer leaves definitely isn't as flavorful as the salmon produced with spring or fall leaves. With time, tea polyphenols caffeine and some other chemicals in the leaves get converted to other components, especially flavonoid, gave it a softer and nicer flavor. That's why Shou Mei ages well in terms of both flavor and health benefits. Shou Mei is great for health. White tea, especially Shou Mei, has been traditionally used to cool the body and cleans the heat of the body, reduce inflammation, improve the health of the liver and the kidneys, improve skin and hair health, treat acne and so on. Shou Mei is best brewed with water at 100 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds. Some people prefer to boil Shou Mei for a few minutes to extract its strong flavor. 
Shou Mei is available in many flavors, including flowery, herbal, fresh, woody, and uh, many other varieties, depending on the tea picking time and the processing methods. Especially some special flavors such as date flavor normally only appear in aged Shou Mei, such as 4 years old or older. Normally, Shou Mei tea is sold in a tea cake shape since Shou Mei leaves are big and very light, which would otherwise take a lot of space in a loose tea leaf form. I have a lot of uh, cake shapes as well as uh, loose leaf Shou Mei tea. This is the it's a cake shape Shou Mei. And uh, this is the and uh, this is the loose leaf Shou Mei. The Shou Mei decoction has a beautiful light orange color with a nice strong flavor. To summarize, Shou Mei is a great white tea with great health benefits and also very affordable. More than 60% of white tea in the market is actually Shou Mei. Oftentimes, also unethically sold under the name White Peony or Gong Mei by some companies. So, buyer beware. Please give Shou Mei a try and let me know your experience with it. With that, let's move on to today's main topic. Topics covered in today's video include first, motivation, second, evolution of a Chinese martial art practice, third, brief history of a contemporary wushu. Fourth, traditional Kung Fu versus contemporary Wushu. Fifth, misperceptions. Sixth, demonstration. And seventh, takeaways. So, without any further ado, let's get started. Topic 1 Motivation. First off, I'd like to say that this is a very happy topic in terms of history and culture. Since I have been witnessing this part of history up close and uh, continue to do so even today, it is my duty to share it with the community. I remember it like yesterday, when I came to Canada over two decades ago. I was shocked by many types of uh, misunderstandings and uh, misperceptions of Chinese martial art practice rampant among the community in the West. For example, a very beginner level practice lacking in any solid martial art structure would often be perceived as a relaxed and advanced practice. Many people also misperceived that traditional Chinese Kung Fu had disappeared from China. To make matters worse, some contemporary Wushu practices were perceived as the traditional way and so on. I have been thinking about making a video to discuss this topic for many years, but I have been largely reluctant to follow through to avoid ruffling feathers. A whole lot of uh, sensitive feathers. Thanks to the passage of time and of course the internet, more and more information has become available to the West and many people in the community have already had a much better understanding of the aforementioned issue. Many people now have a distinctive and clear idea about the major differences between traditional Kung Fu practice and the contemporary Wushu performance. So, this video will provide historical and cultural information and supporting evidence to reinforce your own prior understanding of those differences. Furthermore, I only emphasize the traditional approach since 
This is what I have been practicing and teaching for decades. But emphasizing the traditional approach also needs emphasizing what is not traditional. So, talking about contemporary wushu and comparing and contrasting traditional gongfu and contemporary wushu is thus unavoidable. At the very least, this video can further clarify some misunderstandings. If so, mission accomplished. Again, any observation made without considering the historical and the cultural background is merely scratching the surface. Fortunately, I have published a lot of videos on this channel introducing relevant information on this topic. <clears throat> if you are new to this channel, please watch some of my prior videos related to historical, cultural, and philosophical information, since contextual information paints a comprehensive picture. For example, the video titled Xing Yi Stepping Conception and Imagery is a highly recommended one. Link is in the description. That video explains the imagery concept in Chinese martial art practice, which is based on the traditional Chinese aesthetic conception theory, a term I borrowed from classical Chinese arts such as painting and calligraphy, to elaborate on Chinese martial art appreciation. Make sure you watch it. Then, how did Chinese martial art practice evolve in history? In other words, what were some of the most important historical events that shaped the course of Chinese martial art practice? That brings us to the next topic. Topic 2. Evolution of Chinese martial art practice In many prior videos, I have mentioned that Chinese martial art practice was developed upon ancient military training. Given the countless military conflicts in Chinese history spanning multiple millennia, military training was extremely well developed in China. In Chinese history, it has been very rare, if at all, to see a peaceful transition of power from one dynasty to another. In other words, power was never given, it was taken through military conflicts. At the same time, building a strong military power had been one of the key objectives of any dynasty in Chinese history. As a result, Chinese military practices including strategy, training, battle planning, and of course, the direction of a military battle were quite well developed in ancient times. I'm not too familiar with other cultures and civilizations, but I have studied Chinese history very well and I can provide thorough evidence to support my claim. Throughout documented Chinese military history, weapon training has always been of primary importance. In ancient times, the most effective way to train military soldiers was with weapons, not bare hands. Even though bare hand training was a part of military training, it was always of secondary importance and never the main focus. All classic military training documents devoted major part to weapons training. Famous martial art bare hand training systems also developed parallelly with weapons training. For example, Zhao Kuangyin, the first Song Dynasty emperor, who reigned from 960 CE until his death in 976 CE, was also considered the creator of the famous 32 poster Long Fist which is a popular practice in many areas of China even today. 
This strongly indicates that bare hand training has existed for a long time in China, alongside the primary focus on weapons training. Bare hand training or Quan Fa has been emphasized in all of the classic military training documents. Case in point, consider the Ji Xiao Xin Shu or New Treatise on Military Efficiency, one of the most important military training documents authored between the 1560s to 1580s by the Ming Dynasty general Qi Ji Guang, one of the most prominent military scholars in history. In Volume 14 of the Ji Xiao Xin Shu, Qi Ji Guang clearly stated that, quote, Quan Fa si wu yu yu da zhan zhi ji, ran huo dong shou zu, guan qin zhi ti, si wei chu xue ren yi zhi men ye, end quote. Translation It seems that Quan Fa or bare hand training does not have much impact on the battlefield. However, it can be used to train limbs and make the body move faster so that it can be a skill to start with. End translation. It is evident that ancient military scholars realized the value of a bare hand training as well. Fast forward to the Qing dynasty, the last dynasty in Chinese history. This was a very special dynasty, being a Manchu-led imperial dynasty of China and the last orthodox dynasty instead of the Han people, which formed the majority. During this time, ethnic conflicts was a major concern of the Qing government. As a result, many Qing emperors announced Jin Wu Ling or forbid martial order, or allow forbidding martial art training. By the way, it is worth noting that the event of Jin Wu Ling or forbid martial order did not entirely stop martial art practice. The Jin Wu Ling was only intended to restrict the activity of some groups, not all martial art practitioners. Actually, military training had been very important for thousands of years already. All of the dynasties in the last thousand years had a well-developed system to effectively elect the best-trained martial art practitioners as military officials for royal courts and armies. However, those Jin Wu Ling actually targeted martial art groups with religious or cult-related activities, especially involving military weapons. Sometimes, martial artists had to modify their weapons in order to comply with the regulations. For example, the spearhead had to be removed, thus making the long pole a training equipment. Long story short, Jin Wu Ling targeted the use of military weapons in civilian life, including training and combat. As a result, this event actually became the major driving force behind the popularity of bare hand training about 300 years ago. Ever since, many traditional martial art styles such as Tai Chi, Xing Yi, and Ba Ji, among many others, emerged and became extremely popular around that period which was unprecedented in Chinese military and martial art history. In other words, Jin Mu Ling was one of the most important factors in the development of martial art practice in the last few centuries. So, in Chinese history, Jin Mu Ling had been used by many dynasties but indirectly it triggered and promoted the martial art practice. Then, from the 1910s to the 1950s, 
a period widely considered to be the golden age of the traditional styles, benchmarked it as the first and the best period for martial art practice in recent history. <coughs> so, that was a brief introduction to the evolution of uh, traditional martial art styles as we know them today. Then, how was contemporary wushu developed? Was contemporary wushu invented in the 1950s or during the communist government's time? That brings us to the next topic. Topic 3. A brief history of uh, contemporary wushu. First off, what is contemporary wushu? Is this a new style or a new way of practice? Well, to answer this question, I have to briefly introduce the social political context behind the creation of a contemporary wushu. To do so, I first have to introduce a not so well known name, Ma Liang. Ma Liang was born in Hebei province, a region famous for its many martial arts styles. When Ma Liang was a child, he learned wrestling and Shaolin from Ping Jingyi, a very famous Kuai Jiao, fast wrestling, one of the three major Chinese wrestling styles, and also a great Shaolin master in Baoding, the former provincial capital of Hebei province, later replaced by Tianjin. In 1905, the Qing dynasty government abandoned the Keji Zhi Du, the imperial examination system or the royal court officer selection system, which lasted about 1000 years, and gradually adopted the modern Western education system. Since the cessation of the Keji Zhi Du, all of the scholars of the old system lost the opportunity to become government officials through the old system. So, Ma Liang changed his career path. Instead of studying the old educational materials, he went to Tianjin and attended the first modern military school of China, the Beiyang Wubei Xue Tang or Tianjin Military Academy. Over there, students had to study not only modern military knowledge but also accepted traditional martial arts training. With his dedication, he became a military officer after graduation and eventually got promoted to a high rank of a military officer. As mentioned in many prior videos, during this period, Chinese people, including the Republic government, promoted the martial art practice in order to strengthen and unify the Chinese national spirit. In response to this call, Ma Liang created Zhonghua Xin Wu Shu. Zhonghua means China, Xin means new, Wu Shu means martial art or Wu Shu. This practice was very suitable for group training and very soon it was accepted by the military and education ministry. Later, many schools in China practiced this style, making Ma Liang a very influential martial artist of his time. However, many martial artists at that time were strongly against his approach. Since Zhonghua Xin Wu Shu added more than military training elements and mechanically borrowed some movements from traditional styles, this approach did not reflect the real concept and the practice of the Chinese citizens. Even so, the Republic government, especially the President Yuan Shikai, the one who became an emperor later, sponsored this system. Based on historical research, the Zhonghua Xin Wu Shu could add traditional elements into a modern system, which perfectly 
fit Yuan Shikai's political agenda to restore the feudal system. You can see that in China, a martial art in history always worked with politics together. Eventually, Ma Liang became a warlord. Later, when Japan invaded China, Ma Liang collaborated with the Japanese and got promoted by the Japanese army. No matter how busy he was, he always devoted himself to martial art promotion. For example, many famous masters actually worked under him, such as Yang Hongxiu, one of the best Cha Quan masters from Shandong actually worked under him. By the way, the famous Cha Quan master Wang Ziping actually learned from Yang Hongxiu. Eventually, after Japan lost the war, Ma Liang was sent to prison for collaborating with the Japanese army. Soon after, he passed away in prison around the age of 72. So, historically speaking, Ma Liang was the inventor of the concept of the new wushu practice in the Republic time of China. Fast forward to the 1950s. After the Communist Party came to power in 1949, the government was actively looking for a solution to not only strengthen the physical health of Chinese people, but also to restore the national spirit exactly as the previous government did, but with more modern elements. So, what was the solution they came up with? Since the political system chosen by the communist government was based on the Russian system, Russian influence could be found in almost every aspect of Chinese life back then, including political, economic, social, of course, aesthetic. In a prior video, I introduced that traditional Chinese aesthetics appreciates the pyramid structure which represents a stable and a static approach. In contrast, the Russian-influenced style prefers a reverse pyramid structure. For example, ballet dancing introduced by Russian artists was popular in China. Then, martial art teachers and officials in the support ministry worked together to develop a new martial art training approach which incorporated the Russian artist standard of the reverse pyramid structure into the Chinese martial art training system. This was the original concept behind the creation of a contemporary wushu, a step much further than the new wushu created by Ma Liang since it fundamentally changed the thousands of years old aesthetic standard of the traditional martial art training system. There were many standard martial art routines created soon after. Well, those standard routines were created by the best traditional masters of the time using the traditional aesthetic standard. The new aesthetic standard gradually got infused into the routines and eventually replaced the old standard, gradually being the operative word. Then came the Cultural Revolution, a period in which many elites got eliminated politically and socially. Even worse, some of them got eliminated physically. But martial art practice did not stop in those 10 years. The Cultural Revolution was a political campaign in which many elites got removed, but many traditional martial artists still survived, especially those masters who were not considered elite and did not have any major problem practicing and teaching students in private even though public teaching was under great pressure. For example, 
陈兆奎 ，the son of 陈发科 ，promoted Tai Chi throughout China during this time, and educated many great masters back then. So it is just wrong to say that traditional martial art practice got totally eliminated in the ten years of the Cultural Revolution. To give you another example, in Tianjin. The traditional martial art practice was extremely popular, even in the ten years of the Cultural Revolution, as long as you were careful in choosing the right students and maintained a small group. The end of the Cultural Revolution brought with it another golden age of martial art practice. So, from the end of the 1970s to sometime in the 1980s. Martial art practice, both traditional and contemporary, rose back to popularity. For example, there were many national martial art competitions organized in Tianjin. The recorded demonstrations, from which are very popular on the internet nowadays. Back then, I was a young child, and watching those great demonstrations are still. Some of my most cherished childhood memories. At the same time, many kung fu movies were released and became a great success, inspiring many people to take up martial art practice, leading to further popularity of martial art practice. So many events and phenomena that occurred during that period contributed toward martial art practice. It was truly a great period for martial art and martial artists. Fast forward to around ten years ago, the Chinese economy was rapidly developing and had brought with it social and cultural changes. In the process, and to this day, Chinese people have been looking for a new solution to restore the traditional practice. In many aspects, such as calligraphy, painting, opera, and of course martial art. So, any practice rebranded as a traditional would become a popular practice, a direct result of the national policy of popularizing traditional Chinese culture. So, many contemporary wushu athletes began to claim their practice to be. Traditional, instead of being honest about their wushu practice. All of a sudden, the so-called traditional wushu was in fashion, and contemporary wushu athletes started practicing and promoting the so-called traditional wushu with limited real traditional training as poetry. For example, about ten years ago. A very popular saying in the Chinese martial community went, "Quote: 国家支持传统，我们就是传统。” Oh, since the country support the traditional way, now we are traditional. Due to this co-opting of the term traditional, nowadays it is very hard for a beginner. To distinguish between the real traditional practice and the wushu-based so-called traditional practice, identifying and rectifying this phenomenon in the community in order to keep the practice authentic is one of the motivations behind this video. As I have mentioned in prior videos, contemporary wushu practice is great, but Claiming contemporary wushu practice to be the "quote unquote" traditional practice without the traditional foundation is incorrect. I can go on for hours on the historical context surrounding this topic, but in the interest of time, I will save it for a future discussion. So, what are the differences between the traditional martial art practice? And contemporary wushu, we will discuss that in the next topic. Topic four: Traditional kung fu versus contemporary wushu.
For the rest of this video, I will use the word Kung Fu instead of martial art in order to explain the differences compared to contemporary Wushu. Also, I will only discuss some of the most important differences here. First, Philosophical Foundation Kung Fu and Wushu have different philosophical foundations. More specifically, traditional Kung Fu is based on classical Chinese aesthetics, while contemporary Wushu is based on the opposite standard. When you watch two demonstrations chosen from each of them, you can definitely notice the differences. Again, aesthetics is an important part of the philosophical system. Any practice at higher levels, especially in modern times, is an aesthetic expression of the practitioner's understanding of philosophical concepts. This is the key concept, which again, I have talked about many times in prior videos. Second, traditional Kung Fu emphasizes both self-defense and health benefits, especially the former. Well, contemporary Wushu focuses on athletic performance, mainly in Wushu competitions. For example, in our modern time, traditional practice normally will not sacrifice one's well-being for competition, but professional Wushu athletes may have to compromise their health in order to win the performance competition. So, traditional Kung Fu practice always intends to balance the effort and outcome of a practice. Third, traditional Kung Fu practice emphasizes the applicability of a practice on top of the method of a practice. For example, a very popular saying in the traditional Kung Fu community is 如何练,如何用, or well, contemporary Wushu athletes focus on executing and performing challenging postures, beautiful routines, and fancy movements with the sole purpose of scoring maximum point in the competition at a professional level. Of course, there are many many more differentiators. I have only pointed out three of the most important ones in today's video. Now, I'd like to talk about another interesting phenomenon. There are many difficult movements in the traditional system as well, but those difficult movements are intended for martial applications or self-defense purposes, not just for the sake of fancy demonstrations. So, a very common and unfortunate phenomenon is that some contemporary Wushu practitioners find it difficult to practice some challenging contemporary Wushu movements, because of which they rebrand their existing Wushu practice to quote-unquote traditional Kung Fu without actually possessing sufficient traditional Kung Fu skills. For example, the traditional Xing Yi practice must have a powerful Fa Jin as a testing benchmark. However, some Xing Yi practitioners with a Wu Shu background cannot execute the Fa Jin since they lack the necessary traditional training. They further try to mask their inability or sloppy practice by twisting the language in traditional documents and standards per their convenience. What a pity! Key takeaway Pay close attention when watching a demonstration. With time, you will be able to distinguish between those two systems. It requires a lot of experience, which I'm sure you all will gain with time. When the community on the whole gets to this level, I will consider one of my tasks complete. Topic 5. Misperceptions The ability to distinguish between two systems that resulted from 
cultural, historical, political, and social influences is hard to achieve. As a result, some misperceptions related to them are unavoidable in reality. Today, I'd like to debunk one of the most common misperceptions. Some people believe that in practice, as long as one focuses on the application aspect of a movement or a routine, that is the traditional way. This is a very common misperception. Let's debunk it today. We all know that one of the basic factors to distinguish between the approach used in traditional Kung Fu training from that used in contemporary Wushu training is the objective of each movement. However, merely adding the application elements into a movement without fundamentally adopting the traditional standard, especially the principles derived from the aesthetic standard, is far from enough. As mentioned in the first part of this video, any martial art practice, including a demonstration, is the reflection of its principles, which are rooted in its philosophical foundation. Even though it is an advanced topic, it should be a guiding principle for every practitioner in choosing the traditional way in practice. Also, let me clarify one important point to avoid any possible misunderstandings. Yes, I practice and teach the traditional systems, but that doesn't mean I look at traditional Wushu in a negative light. I respect contemporary Wushu training as well. The athletic expression demonstrated and expressed by Wu Shu reflects the dynamic energy, incredible martial flexibility, and the way to challenging oneself in performing some very hard movements, among many other factors, deserves utmost respect and appreciation. The only thing I'm against here is the contemporary Wushu practice pretending to be so-called traditional practice, which is a martial scam indeed. Topic 6. Demonstration Today, I'd like to demonstrate a short Xing Yi routine. It Topic 7 Takeaways First, to help the community, especially the future generations, to be able to distinguish the differences between the traditional martial art practice and the contemporary Wushu is important. Second, Chinese martial art practice was based on weapon training and gradually evolved with time. Bare hand training system received accelerated development in the last 300 years due to government policies toward martial art training. Third, contemporary Wushu originated in traditional practice but has been gradually moving away by adapting a new concept of training based on non traditional approach. Fourth, Traditional Kung Fu and contemporary Wushu are different in terms of philosophical foundation, practice approach, and specific training methods. Fifth, some people believe that in practice, as long as one focuses on the application aspect of a movement or a routine, that is the traditional way. Remember, this is a misperception. 
merely adding the application elements into a movement without fundamentally adopting the traditional standard will not make your practice traditional. <clears throat> that concludes today's video. A quick reminder to send me your questions for next week's Q&A video, either in the comments or on the Ask Dao Yi channel of the Dao Yi Discord or by email me if you prefer to be anonymous. Thanks for watching, see you next time and enjoy your practice.